So, hi everyone. Um, I will start, uh, so as you noticed, we start recording the, the meeting today for those who cannot uh, make it and uh, who still want to listen to the amazing presentations of the speakers today. Uh, thank you all for joining us for this uh, webinar of our Acting Against Pollution series in the Littlest Plus campaign of the Foundation for Environmental Education. Um, before uh, giving the floor to the Blue Flag International Director, Joanne Durand, I will uh, just share a couple of house rules. I'm Alessandro Venti. I also work uh, in the Blue Flag team. Um, so just for the smooth uh, proceeding of this webinar, um, we will listen to a series of presentations by our speakers today about responsible stakeholders. Uh, it's a very interesting theme, uh, especially for the tourism sector. This is going to be the focus. Uh, and uh, sustainable tourists, but in this case, well, the, 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 the topic of what a responsible stakeholder is and what they do. Um, just in terms of house rules, uh, <clears throat> if you have questions for the speakers, I would like to ask you to write them in the chat and we will try the, our best to keep track of the questions and ask them uh, if we have some time at the end uh, of the series of presentations. Uh, as you heard before, the webinar is recorded uh, so that others can also uh, listen to it afterwards. And uh, um, we ask you for uh, the sake of the connection, maybe to keep the cameras off unless uh, you are one of the speakers. And um, uh, yeah, so if you uh, want to ask them something, you can just uh, write it in the chat. Um, we will also share maybe some links uh, during the presentations for additional resources and so on, uh, so you can use that. And uh, well, that's uh, mostly it for me. Uh, <laughs> I would like to thank you all for being here today, and uh, I will immediately leave the floor to Joan for a few opening words. Thank you very much, Alessandro. Uh, welcome. Welcome everybody. Uh, I do see some names already that I know within the participants. So I know that we have people from Brazil, from South Africa, from all across Europe, and we do have our partners uh, that are uh, making an effort to, to share their insights and presentations today. I'm Joan, I'm the International Director for the Blue Flag Program at the Foundation for Environmental Education. Welcome everybody. Uh, this is the last Blue Flag webinar of this series. Uh, there will be more next year, uh, but I would like to thank you all for taking the time to join uh, at the end of this month. Thank you so much. Um, today, we're going to talk about responsible stakeholders. Uh, we're going to talk about sustainability, innovation, and I'm pleased uh, and thankful to welcome uh, ICLE, IUCN, and Pick Up Here. Uh, long terms, recent partners, but we're all working towards the same goals and uh, trying to uh, have a great impact uh, towards the main issues we are all facing. So I will be very brief. I'm already sorry, I won't be able to stay until the end, uh, busy schedule ahead. But I'd like to thank, again, uh, the people at the foundation, our partners uh, that are supporting the program by being here, or by all the forms and for many years. So thank you, welcome, and uh, please enjoy. Thank you, Joanne. So before I leave the floor to the, to the speakers today and I introduce them to you, I would just like to give a little and very short uh, overview of the topic today, because there are many labels that we uh, associate uh, with tourism, you know, sustainable tourism, responsible tourism. Um, and we would like to maybe uh, understand a little bit better uh, what this uh, word means. Uh, and, uh, you know, there are many definitions out there, but uh, I think just to narrow it down uh, and to prepare the floor, let's say to the speakers today, I um, try to do a little bit of our research uh, that I would like to share with you. Uh, I would like to start uh, by quoting the Cape Town Declaration on Responsible Tourism. Uh, it was uh, um, put together in Johannesburg in uh, 2002. And uh, it says that responsible tourism is about making better places for people to live in and better places for people to visit. 
that requires that operators, hoteliers, uh, governments, local people and tourists take responsibility, take action to make tourism more sustainable. And um, we would like to understand what this concept of responsibility means, right? So uh, we see that there is also um, some mention of this concept in, for example, the ISO standard uh, 26000 in uh, 2010 was developed and it mentions a series of dimensions. For example, uh, a responsible stakeholder should uh, contribute to sustainable development, including health and the welfare of society in how it takes decisions, right? So we have a mention of society and welfare here, not just the environmental aspect of sustainability. Um, it should take into account the expectations of other stakeholders. So uh, we're talking about uh, a stakeholder that is aware uh, that there are other parties involved and that their decisions have an effect and repercussions on other people in the network, so to speak. Uh, then the compliance with uh, applicable laws at multi-level uh, perspective, right? So national, local, regional, international, that's also uh, a factor that we need to take into account. And um, this practice should be integrated throughout the entire organization and uh, developed and practiced uh, in its relationship with the outside world also. So these are some of the dimensions of uh, responsibility according to these couple of quotes. And uh, I think, you know, uh, since we're talking about responsible stakeholders and today we have uh, representatives of some organizations that have to do with the environment, uh, with the marine award, for example, with the public authorities and so on. I also wanted to bring the perspective of um, another important stakeholder uh, of tourism, which is the tourist, the traveler in a way. And uh, I bumped into this um, document, uh, Tips for Responsible Traveler by UNWTO and the World Committee on Tourism Ethics mentioning a series of um, dimensions and uh, aspects that a responsible traveler should take into account. For example, honoring the host and uh, the common heritage. Uh, so there is a societal and cultural uh, um, dimension here, protecting the planet. So there is a reference also to the environmental dimension of sustainability again, supporting the local economy, traveling safely, and so on. So we really recognize that in the concept of responsibility, there are multiple uh, dimensions and facets in a way uh, that contributes to the complexity of this uh, concept. And uh, my hope for today is that by listening to the best practices and uh, presentations of these speakers that we have, uh, you can take home uh, a few ideas or some inspiration on how you yourself can uh, make your organizations or reality, or even if you are uh, travelers, how you can uh, behave in a more responsible way or you, how you can implement this concept of responsibility in, in your daily lives. So uh, without further ado, I would like to introduce uh, Inge Kotze, um, Director of uh, Biodiversity, Nature and Health at ICLE. ICLE uh, works at multiple scales, uh, building connections uh, across local, regional, national and global actors and policies. Uh, they create uh, system change, uh, develop integrated solutions, uh, and really focus on transforming urban areas in this sustainable transition. Uh, but ICLE also brings, uh, together with other stakeholders, cities with nature that Ingrid is surely going to mention. And uh, uh, ICLE is also sitting in the International Jury of Blue Flag, uh, so uh, it's a really dear partner for us. And I would like to leave the floor to you, Ingrid, and thank you for being here today. Thank you so much. And if I can just share my screen, uh, there you go. Let me just make sure that everybody can see it. Thank you. So thanks for giving us such a great introduction to, to ICLE. You've saved me uh, a bit of work there, <laughs> Alessandro. Um, all I wanted to add to this um, is just to give you an indication of our geographic uh, spread. Um, as a global network, we um, have more than 2,500 cities and regions that are members of ICLE. Um, and as Alessandra mentioned, these are cities and, and regional governments that are committed to sustainable urban development. 
Um, as an organization, we active in more than 125 countries globally. Um, and this is quite an impressive um, a, a footprint, as it were, and particularly if we keep in mind the current trends in urbanization. Now, why would tourism and sustainability be uh, um, a factor? And I, I was looking, I also did some research. I was looking at some really interesting um, uh, um, facts, facts uh, you know, related to GDP, um, the fact that uh, globally tourism accounts for approximately 5% of global CO2 emissions, which is quite a big amount. Um, IUCN, and we have here a speaker of IUCN, um, has indicated that tourism activities impact directly on 80% of the world's most significant biodiversity areas. And biodiversity is one of my, um, it's my area of responsibility. So a lot of what I see and experience in terms of tourism is looking at it from, from that particular lens. And there are several more uh, um, uh, interesting facts and figures. Now, what I'm going to try and do today is just look at the global policy context, which defines what a responsible stakeholder in the sector should be doing. Um, and then I'm going to give some practical examples where we look at exactly what, you know, what's happening at the ground. What are, what are cities doing? Um, and these are our cities that we that we work with either as project cities or they're members of, of ICLEI, or they are uh, signed up to uh, Cities with Nature, which is a partnership initiative um, and includes um, both uh, IUCN, but also um, uh, um, Blue Flag. So this is, I mean, obviously these are some really high level statements. And we look at the uh, statement from um, Antonio Guterres, who's the um, Secretary General of the UN, who talks about um, sustainable practices need to be aligned with the SDGs uh, in order to, for us to reach the 1.5 degree future that we're looking for. And the OCDE talks about a whole of government approach. Now, whole of government, whole of society is something that's very embedded within the new global biodiversity framework that was adopted at uh, the Biodiversity COP in Montreal last year. Um, and then I think the other thing that I just wanted to highlight is if we look at the tourism sector within the uh, um, SDGs, you can see in this diagram how it's there are direct links to um, many of those SDGs. We, for example, um, and Alessandra talked about the whole concept of welfare, um, looking at, at SDG three, um, the gender equality issue. Um, the, the need for responsible consumption and production. This was also something that came out that Alessandra mentioned in the Cape Town Declaration way back a couple of, of years ago, where we need to look at sustainable uh, patterns and, and modes of, of um, consumption and production. And we'll see that many of these things are coming out now in some of the initiatives that uh, cities are implementing. Um, also the two biodiversity SDGs, uh, 14 and 15, and, and looking at issues of um, healthy ecosystems being respected. And um, these are often the reasons why so much of the tourism or tourists go to these areas. And just quickly, um, this is some uh, points from the uh, 2022 World Tourism Day report. And you can see here, for example, the, the vision on responsible recovery of the tourism sector, obviously following the, the pandemic, looking at issues of social inclusion, public health, circular economy, and then of course, both climate and biodiversity. Um, there's also an initiative around global tourism plastics, which is very pertinent. We are at the moment globally negotiating a new plastics protocol. There was a meeting recently in Paris, and this looks at how one can reduce the plastics um, footprint. It comes again back to the point of consumption and production. Um, and then there's also the International Network for Sustainable Tourism Observatories. Um, from the Glasgow Declaration on Climate Action in Tourism within the climate space, there have been some important pronouncements. Um, looking, for example, um, there were signatories to supporting global commitments to halve those emissions by 2030, um, and how tourism impacts and tourism can responsible tourism can contribute to achieving these things. Now, this is a declaration that has been signed by more than 530 organizations globally, and it includes various of the tourism stakeholders, including major international uh, 
uh, companies and tourism boards, etc. So this is all very um, impressive. And if one looks at what's happened in the biodiversity space, um, I think we, you know, tourism is certainly a very important industry for, for um, biodiversity conservation. In my own country, South Africa, a lot of our um, tourism is directly linked to our beautiful um, biodiversity, our biomes, our national parks, um, our reserves, et cetera. Um, but it is also something that can have a very big and very negative impact um, on these areas if it's not sustainably managed, particularly if we look at things like beaches, uh, sensitive um, environments such as forests in many of the areas of, this, of the world, they are very threatened. Um, and the CBD, the Convention on Biological Diversity, has addressed this issue of tourism for a number of years. There are um, besides the, the sort of guidelines that you can see um, on the screen, there have been several decisions. There was a decision in um, at COP12 uh, um, on um, biodiversity and tourism development, where it specifically looked at the significant relationship between tourism and, and biodiversity and the need for managing um, ecologically sensitive areas very carefully when it comes to, to tourism. And then the whole concept of mainstreaming biodiversity also within the tourism sector was something that was, there was a decision around this um, at COP13, uh, also in COP14, where we looked at the tourism sector as an important role player and stakeholder within the whole mainstreaming of biodiversity um, sector. Now, if we look at the advantages of sustainable tourism, and I'm trying to get a little bit more practical here, um, for, for specifically at the local level, there's a lot that, that um, has been done and there are many advantages. So for one, it's about uh, protecting our natural and cultural resources, um, looking at the responsible use of, of those resources and ensuring the integrity of those assets so that we respect, sorry, I have a cat that's interested in this topic, um, so that we respect our, our, our nature and our culture Community engagement and empowerment is very important. And the whole con concept of economic resilience and diversification. And this just brings me to a point. There was, many of you may know that the MedCOP has just closed. It was held in um, uh, Tangier now uh, last week and it came out with a declaration. And the declaration um, from the MedCOP um, referred to the whole concept of the blue economy, which is based on the circular economy principles. Um, and specifically, they identified looking at um, investing in the blue economy for to address tourism, aquaculture, nature-based solutions, ecosystem services, waste management, and the nexus between these things, including things like water management, uh, and maritime transport. Um, and then the other one was looking at how to enhance the other recommendation that came out of the MedCOP declaration was how to enhance the resilience of, of cities and territories to um, reduce the impacts of, of climate change and promote nature-based solutions, including through tourism uh, uh, initiatives so that we can achieve the SDGs, our biodiversity targets, our climate targets, et cetera. So, one sees the understanding and the realization of the importance of sustainable tourism and responsible tourists permeating into all of these global agendas. Um, if we start getting a little bit more practical now, um, how does how does ICLI, for example, engage at a local level? So I've just explained obviously that we do in we do have a role to play and we do advocate for the role of, of subnational governments in the global advocacy space, whether it's the climate uh, or the biodiversity COPs or the SDGs, et cetera, um, but also at a practical level. Um, and we do this in a number of ways, partly through engaging the cities by providing trainings or um, resources and guidelines, uh, technical advice, et cetera, and also through, through projects. And in doing some research around what the cities, are, ICLI cities are doing around the world, um, or our, our regions that belong to ICLI or that are signed up to cities of nature or regions with nature, I've come across some really interesting initiatives. Um, for example, in the um, province of Skåne in Sweden, they have what they call their project footprints. Um, and this looks at the, the sort of um, motto of this project is leave nothing but footprints. And they have a very clear and definite project around 
how to get how to do outreach and how to encourage visitors tourists particularly within the nature reserves and the natural areas there to to reduce their footprint um, and to leave nothing but footprints so it's around waste it's around all of those sorts of responsible behaviors um, there are several cities um, around the world that focus or that have a pollution reduction focus also tied in with their tourism initiatives uh, for example, the, the city of Australia, um, they produce, uh, promote sustainable tourism and pollution reduction specifically around their beach areas and their harbors, the marines, um, and they've got very strict regulations around water quality, marine ecosystems, water monitoring, uh, and then preventing measures to implement pollution runoff. And this is very much part and parcel of their sustainable tourism um, initiatives. The city of Niigata in Japan is an interesting one. This is a city that was accredited as a wetland city under the wetland city accreditation scheme last year at the Ramsar COP on wetland, uh, the conservation of wetlands. Um, and they focus their tourism uh, initiatives around cultural preservation, nature conservation and community engagement. And of course their wetlands are an important part of that. And they promote sustainable and responsible uh, tourism practices that are very much tied in with sustainable development um, to provide a memorable experience, but also then preserve the, the natural and cultural heritage of that area. Um, my own city Cape Town also has done quite a lot in trying to produce pollution in the coastal areas. Uh, we've looked also at water conservation initiatives. A few years ago, we had the situation we called um, day zero, where we nearly ran out of water. We were literally three or four days away from running out of water. We had to reduce our, our water usage daily to a maximum 50 liters, and that's for everything per person a day. And it included some very interesting initiatives working with hotels on how to how to um, reduce water usage by, for example, in, installing um, water reduction shower heads, um, all kinds of other uh, initiatives. Um, and then, of course, also quite a lot of work around recycling programs to minimize pollution uh, around our coastline. Um, in Cancun, in Mexico, which was the site of a or the city where the uh, COP, Biodiversity COP was hosted in 2016. They have some great work around marine ecosystems, uh, coral reef restoration, which is something that's very much affected by uh, effluent running into the seas, the, the, the pollution, pollutants coming into the seas and destroying the corals. And they focus a lot on educational programs to, to explain to the tourists why the corals are important and what sort of behaviors a tourist should avoid. Singapore is another city where they look at water conservation, uh, wastewater treatment technologies, etc. And they have really amazing green spaces, waterfront areas um, to, to sort of, you know, harmonize and, and create a synergy between uh, the experience of a city, but also a city, um, basically a park in a, in a city. Barcelona, also again, wastewater. So this is, this is the theme that's obviously quite important. The whole idea of, it comes back to the issue of consumption and production, looking at less consumptive and less polluting uh, practices. Um, but this city has also got a sustainable transport program, uh, for example, bike sharing. And there are you know, various programs um, like this, for example, in the city of, um, um, what's it in Mozambique? I can't remember the name now, but they have uh, a really interesting uh, um, focus on bike uh, using um, bicycles, and and they have this major bike uh, race every year where they um, encourage tourists also to participate in. Um, something else that ICI does is we have uh, uh, projects. Uh, this particular part project, the culture is a, a Horizon 2020 project. Um, ICLEI is one of the many, many partners that's involved in this project. Um, it's focused specifically on Europe. And one of its um, aspects or one of its elements focuses specifically on the circular economy and how that can be interpreted and translated within the um, tourism sector. So they again, look at things like energy, um, uh, modes of energy and, and transport, um, water consumption, reducing waste, um, and all of the sort of circular economy initiatives that are associated with, with tourism and being more responsible um, 
users of, of tourist sites. Um, Cities with Nature um, is an important um, initiative. Um, this, as I said just now, it's an, uh, a partnership initiative um, and it includes many, many partners around the world. Um, ICLE hosts the platform, the online platform, but uh, it's not an ICLE uh, initiative. We have uh, IUCN was one of our founding partners. WWF is a partner. Blue Flag is a partner. The uh, UNIP is one of our partners. There are many, many more. And what we try and do through this uh, platform is to uh, educate and to share resources to our cities and the regions. Uh, the sister platform is called Regions with Nature. Uh, we have amazing resources that we share on there. We are setting up various communities of practice. There's already one on coastal um, cities and coastal management. Um, and together with Blue Flag, um, we, for example, one of the things that Alessandro mentioned earlier is we form part of the um, adjudication board for the Blue Flag beaches. This is a a new uh, partnership, and we're very proud of being able to um, participate in this, this initiative. Um, and we also have other uh, uh, benefits of the, the platform in that we have, it's linked to the uh, new targets, the biodiversity targets under the global biodiversity uh, framework. And there's a way in which cities can make their commitments um, to protecting their natural environment, including through maybe tourism initiatives, or as I said earlier, reducing pollution um, effluent into water bodies, uh, wetlands, etc. cetera. Um, this is uh, just one of the blue flag beaches from my own country. Um, in fact, um, Lettenberg Bay has been a blue flag beach for, for very long. It's in our garden route. The garden route is a tourism mecca in my country, which is very much linked to the natural beauty, the scenic beauty, um, the, the specific, uh, the forest, the um, that we get in that area and the coastline. Uh, that picture on the right hand is one of the beaches and the um, little uh, um, island at the back, it's not so much an island, it's, it's the Roburg uh, Nature Reserve. And what has been really amazing about um, becoming a blue flag beach for this particular city is that it has helped it address um, wastewater treatment issues, improve water quality, because obviously this is one of the important requirements of having a blue flag beach. And through associating with the blue flag program and being one of the blue flag beaches for so long, the, the city has managed to keep up a very high standard of, of water quality, wastewater treatment, um, et cetera. So it's improved the pollution, water pollution, water quality in the area, the quality of the environment, as well as the tourism ex experience. And before I, I close, I just want to say that what we're seeing um, through our advocacy work, through the work that we do in cities in the form of training and, and resources sharing, um, knowledge management, as well as projects, is that there's a growing realization um, amongst the stakeholders, um, and they're diverse, um, businesses, tourists, NGOs, um, conservation agencies, um, authorities, et cetera, that the future resilience of our tourism sector, which as I said, is in many parts of the world, an important part of the local economy and important contributor to achieving many of our our climate and, and conservation and sustainability targets is that it, the, the, the resilience of that uh, tourism depends on the sector's ability to really contribute to reducing the climate pathway and to reducing the negative impacts on biodiversity loss. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ingrid, for the lovely presentation. It ticked so many of the boxes that we talked at the beginning. You talked about partnerships. You talk about how ICLE and Cities with Nature really act uh, uh, in a context, in a network with other stakeholders uh, to really promote this transition to responsibility and sustainability. Uh, it was really enlightening for me to listen about these exam concrete examples of uh, the ICLE network. But for me, one of the things that I found really interesting about the presentation was how in many of these examples, uh, it really starts with building this awareness, uh, not just uh, um, for the stakeholder per se, but also with others. So making others responsible as well in their behavior, in their decisions. So for example, the example of Cancun that you mentioned, how they are doing this through education, uh, how many of these initiatives really 
pass through local communities, tourists, and so on, enabling them to make the right choice by raising an issue and making them part of the solution. So I think it was really important how we have to first realize where the problems are for us to be responsible in the way we address the issue. So really, thank you, Ingrid, for getting the ball rolling with this very interesting, interesting presentation. And now I will uh, present uh, the next uh, speakers for today. Uh, we have from uh, the International Union for Conservation of Nature, IUCN, we have Mercedes Munoz Cañas, uh, who is Marine Biodiversity and Blue Economy Program Manager at IUCN, and Arnaud Teixidor, uh, who is Ecosystem Resilience and Spatial Planning Program Officer. Uh, just a couple of words about IUCN. Uh, it is a membership union of government and civil society organizations. They work to advance sustainable development and the conservation of nature. It is active around the world. Uh, they work in research, analysis of impactful projects. They have been active for more than 70 years. Uh, so lots of experience there that we can tap into. And uh, they have more than um, 1,400 members around the world. So I leave the floor immediately to you. I'm really looking forward to this presentation and thank you for joining us today. Um, hi, hello, good afternoon, everyone. Um, could you confirm that the slides are properly shared? Yeah, okay. I perfect. can see that full screen. Can you try changing one slide so we see if they roll? So yeah, they changed, okay. perfect. perfect. Uh, okay, so um, I won't introduce much ourselves. Uh, thank, thank you, Alessandra and Blue Flag, for having us here. I think it was great uh, the presentation from Ingrid before us because she laid out a lot of foundations you know, about uh, you know how tourism can respond to the climate and biodiversity crisis that we are facing. Uh, for the presentation today, uh, we are coming from the IUCN Center for Mediterranean Cooperation. We are based in Malaga, in southern Spain. As, as you know, in the Mediterranean, tourism is a, is a key factor, a key sector for addressing many of the environmental pressures on ecosystems. And today, basically, the idea is to, to land some projects in the ground that we have been working and, and some initiative focused on, on pollution and plastics that um, Mercedes is going to present later. And to see you know, through them, in a way, how in, stakeholders are engaging uh, in sustainability and, and some of the challenges you know, that we are facing when, when trying to, to deliver integrated solutions in the ground. Um, just very briefly, um, IUCN, as you mentioned, is a membership membership organization. Our you know for co for core focus is nature, is nature and biodiversity, but also like how nature you know, can help you know in a moment of of uh, of, of climate crisis. Um, we are a membership organization made up of mainly state and government agencies, NGOs, and indigenous groups. And usually, these are our main stakeholders in terms of like you know how our work provides impact on the ground. So usually we are not doing you know, activities on, on the ground, but we are working with these stakeholders at the same time that we're develop, delivering different policies or changing some practices. Lately, we are starting to engage more with the private sector uh, uh, directly or, or through other members in, in projects. Um, but just to give this context, right, we usually have an entry point, usually not much as a, as a, as a kind of a, a grassroots organization, but more uh, supporting you know, our members on, on delivering change. Uh, in the case of the Mediterranean, uh, uh, we have members in, in all the countries around the Mediterranean basin. A lot of different uh, partnerships are involved in many uh, uh, multilateral uh, um, uh, settings. And for today, we, as I mentioned, I will talk briefly myself about two initiatives that are linked with tourism, with ecotourism in protected areas and with uh, beaches, uh, making it more relevant for, for the blue flag. And then uh, later, Mercedes is going to talk about uh, uh, some work on, on plastic. Um, first, um, uh, a very nice example of, of some of our work we are doing uh, with our members and, and the stakeholders in, in the Met is working in, in protected areas. Um, as you may know, IUCN has uh, done a lot of work at setting a standards in designating, managing, governing, and also visiting and managing tourism in protected areas. Uh, uh, through that, we are working in several programs in the, in the Mediterranean and across the, the planet. And one of them that we have quite at heart is, is called Meet. that it's an initiative trying, maybe not so much at the regulatory side, but not working at how to manage demand, no? at, at creating interesting products that can bring tourists and can have a positive impact in, in destinations, especially protected areas. 
So through this, we have worked in, in many protected areas across the Met. Uh, in this map, it's still out of date, but we have worked in, in more, than 50, with more than 50 protected areas directly with them or with the managing authorities. At the end, is bringing you know, ideas about how to improve governance, how to improve the type of products that are being offered that are providing you know, good impacts uh, also to the different communities and the different economic sectors that, that, that are uh, interacting and, 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 and embedded in the protected area, you know, like with, uh, with uh, agricultural practices or, or, or mining or some other activities like salt pans. And also what we're trying to do is, is to answer a very difficult question. And that's uh, what is sustainable and what is ecotourism? No, like uh, where are the thresholds? Where are the what makes them, you know, ecotourism or not ecotourism? No, at this in this sense of providing uh you know um positive impacts for, for communities and positive impacts for conservation. No? And we have been trying to do that. It's a challenging work. And one of the ways to do it that we have been working is developing. Uh, a, a system of uh, measuring the ecological footprint of, of uh, the, um, the ecotourism products. So I think this is a nice example of a, of a work done with a, a Sardinia region in Italy with the Porto Continent uh, Regional Park and a, and a tour operator called Viking Sardinia. You know that they were trying to see like how to make their operations more sustainable and creating products that are attractive and, and have a, a low impact. So I think it's very cool because they developed a, a program that since you arrive to the island, you just go by bike or walk. Uh, so, so it's quite interesting in the sense of providing uh, inter uh, nice experiences. And then we, we went on, no, on, on trying to measure no, the, these impacts that they are having through this ecological footprinting. No? And, and if you look at the, at the left diagram, it's quite interesting. If you see like audit round one and full test round two, you see, you know, and you see uh, how the, the footprint of these packets you know, of activities done cycling, no, multi-day trip, has no and and you see that in round one you know the impact was very high and then it went very low and this was very about food you know like about how to to manage food and how which type of food you are offering how much food which type of food and and at the end you know, we're saying okay now we are going everyone by everywhere by buy but actually your your footprint the main driver is food no so how to reduce it um so i think it's a good example not seeing how you know uh Using like tools, uh, you know, a private organization can engage you know, with their suppliers, you no, know, and at, at reducing their footprint and reaching points, you know, that are, uh, you know, being a, are kind of can be benchmarked then in terms of, for example, carbon footprinting that is being done at a global level uh, and provide information that is meaningful to travelers, you not know, to make uh, better travel decisions. So this is um, um, a one case, you no, know, of of uh, uh, private sector uh, engagement, and uh, this is a, kind of like some reflection you know, from the tour operator and about how you know working on these, you know, they can do some internal learning, and they also can think about how sustainability can be part of a, of a cool experience. You no, know? it, it needs to be something attractive for a for a tourist to engage with. And the second example I want to share, uh, related with uh, with beaches, is. Um, the complexity you know, of trying to deliver na nature oriented approaches in, in beach management. No? Um, this is coming from uh, kind of like two places. One is uh, IUCN, the standards of nature based solutions, no? and how using uh, nature you know, to provide uh, you know, societal benefits and, 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 and improve human well being, uh, local livelihoods in coastal communities, but also to provide biodiversity benefits no? and improving the, the um, the, the status of, of ecosystems. And one of the ways to deliver NBS uh, has been work that we have been doing in beaches. And there was very interesting, uh, I think I'm missing one slide. Anyway, not, not a problem. Um, is uh, realizing um, in beaches, uh, uh, in the Mediterranean, many of them has a lot of Posidonia, no? of, uh, of leaves in there. And uh, the reality is these leaves are very, very important, you know, like for for uh, stopping erosion. But actually, the perception from the beach operators, local authorities, beach users is generally negative about that. You know? So that means that it's leading to unsustainable practices. So what happens in this context is like, you know, uh, there is a decision maker that needs to make decisions that actually is not popular with, uh, you know, uh, the economic operators and that it's you know, maybe even less, uh, sometimes even less uh, um, acceptable by by uh, beach users, and no, and and how to deal no with these different um, understandings of what should be done. No, another 
you know, interesting fact. Now, if you see like this in these graphs, um, it's hard to, to do a comparison, but basically the, the, the result was that actually uh, economic operators have a more negative perception than actual users. So, you know, the op operators are, you know, trying to defend practices that, you know, in their perception, their customers are seeing in a better light than they might think so. So, so just to evidence, you know, that uh, uh, delivering this type of solutions, you know, uh, information and perception is also like a very, a very key uh, uh, role. So to to tackle this, we have been working in several um, uh, tools, you not know, to to support uh, practitioners and and beach managers on on how to go about it in terms of like making the case for it, in terms of like how to communicate it and how to engage stakeholders. Uh, but in the end, you know, it's very challenging. You know, like at the end. You know, like I think it's a nice example you know, from our project partners in, in Croatia, you know, saying you know, in 2013, we have a very nice uh, clean beach that everyone loved. And now, you know, we're trying to, you know, uh, uh, deliver these uh, nature based solutions or these nature oriented solutions that actually are, are protecting the beach, are improving the quality of the water, etc. But the perception is still maybe not there you know, for supporting the, the, the management decision making makers to, to, to hold it. So, so that's it. I just want to kind of like uh, touch on these two uh, uh, interesting settings. Uh, and I now I will give the floor to, to my colleague, uh, Merthe, that's going to work, talk about uh, uh, plastics. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Arnau. And now we're going to the, the plastic area. It's true that um, I, I'm going to focus the my little presentation in the Mediterranean, but just to mention that IUCN, as Sarnal was, was saying, it's an international organization. So we do develop projects and we have a plastic program that is global. So we do have other initiatives around um, the, the, the entire world actually. But um, I'm going to focus on the Mediterranean because this is where the Center for Mediterranean Cooperation collaborates. And just to mention, I, I really like to start with this, um, with this video, because uh, it shows you how the plastic comes into our little Mare Nostrum and how it comes from the land. Um, next slide, please, Arnal. So uh, when we, um, in, in just this little, you, you realize that the importance of working with the different stakeholders, mainly on the land, especially in the coastal areas. And as facts that we do know is that even if the Mediterranean has just the 1% of the entire water of our just unique ocean. Let's just put that we have one ocean because everything is really interconnected. So whatever it happens in one area, it affects other areas of the world. Um, it uh, accumulates around the 7% of the plastic pollution of the, of the world. That means that around the Mediterranean, on some of the studies is uh, accumulating around 1 million, over 1 million tons of plastic. And the flows that enters every year is around 229,000 tons. Those are huge numbers. And for me, sometimes it's very hard to people understand what is the amount that the Mediterranean is getting every year. So I usually use this concept saying that it's like if somebody um, was just um, putting 500 uh, containers of uh, plastic in the Mediterranean every day. So that's, you know, uh, 500 containers every day of plastic. That's something that we can, imagine better than 229,000 tons of plastics. And um, unfortunately, if we don't react, the, 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 yeah, the tendency says that probably this number will double in, five, in 2040. And um, I like to put these numbers because for me, this, this is, these are facts, this, this, this is the truth and that's what we have to deal with. And it's very nice, or at least not nice, but it's very good to know what are we dealing with? What is this, the, the, the problem and what is the scale of the problem? So we can start working to find the solutions. Some of them will be easy, some of them will take, care, we, will take more time, but at the end, all together and the different stakeholders would be able to work together to, to find the solution. Um, next slide, please. So uh, when we have these facts in, in IUCN, we were thinking, okay, so what would be the, the, the key um, activities that we should, we should do in order to try to solve the problem or at least 
let's tackle what we know and let's try to reduce this problem. For us, one of the things is to keep understanding and, and keep enhancing the knowledge on the origins of, my, uh, of the marine plastics. Because when you mentioned, there is a lot of pictures out there with a lot of plastic in the Mediterranean, in the water, but most of it comes from land. And you need to work from land to reduce what is happening in the marine environment. But at the end, this marine environment will come to those beautiful beaches that are being used by many of the stakeholders. Um, of course, the policy informing, as uh, it was mentioned today, um, actually, even if I'm just working on the Mediterranean, this global treaty that is happening, IUCN is one of the observers, and we are there trying to uh, create this treaty that uh, will um, tackle the plastic problem, um, uh, hopefully by uh, soon, very, very soon. And the key thing, and that's why uh, I think this, the, the next slides will, will, I will share some of the work that we're doing is sharing knowledge and best practices among the different stakeholders. And this for me is key because there are many things that have been happening around the Mediterranean, but we don't exchange much. And that means that sometimes they're beautiful and very nice and wonderful um, ideas, but we cannot scale up the results because we don't collaborate much between us. Um, next slide, please. As for, the, um, as for the knowledge, I just wanted to put here a few examples. I'm not going to go in depth, but uh, the one that I want to highlight here is the Mediterranean Mare Plasticum, because the data, the data that I show in the first uh, slide is coming from there, in case somebody wants to know more about the methodology we're using and, and how did we got to these numbers. Uh, you can just go and, and review the document. Um, of course, IUCN produced this, but there are many other organizations that agree more or less in the amount and the numbers that I uh, shared with you. Um, next slide, please. Um, so when we, we, we do work in knowledge, but as I said, thanks to this knowledge, we're able to develop actions that are more targeted. And this is essential because uh, you can do many activities, but you don't know how much they, they will, the impact they will have. So for us, it's very important to go from scientific knowledge and then when we compile all the information, we do uh, develop the actions that will have higher impact. For example, one of the work that we did is uh, we developed a methodology with uh, uh, United Nations in which we were able to understand which are the sectors, for example, are leakage and the plastic most into the Mediterranean. And we targeted a few sectors. Here we included the tourism sector and we went into two pilot uh, uh, islands, one was Minorca and the other one was Cyprus. And when we got all this information coming from the data that was available, we were able with the different stakeholders to develop an action plan. An action plan very well targeted that could uh, produce more impact than other actions that for sure would have impact, but not as much as the ones that uh, we found. Uh, with all this exercise, actually, we developed another document that is uh, the blueprint with other organizations, many uh, several organizations of the of the Mediterranean area, and in which we wanted to um, summarize the work that we did and how we can approach just scale up solutions to achieve the zero plastic pollution in the Mediterranean. In this case, on the islands, because the project was more targeting uh, islands. Next slide, please. And um, we didn't even stay there. I, I really like uh, working with the, the consultants we had in Cyprus and in Minorca, because they, um, for example, in Minorca, we, they developed the, what is called the Pesc Act Minorca. And what they did, what I thought that it was a waste, for example, which was fishing gears, uh, fishing nets, uh, they used the fishing nets with the artisans of the island to create new products which is great because you not only take what for me was just the waste and didn't know what to do, but they took it as a first product to, um, to develop others like this beautiful plant. Um, um, I mean, yeah, um, how do you call that? Uh, lamp, sorry, that you see there or the, the purse. And, uh, and you are also helping the artisans to develop their work. It is still in the working process, but it's, it's wonderful to see that this change is possible. And, and they select the fishing nets thanks to the results that uh, we found in, in, the, in our studies. Um, I wanted to highlight that we did a story map there on the plastic pollution crisis, that it's available on the website in case somebody wants to know um, 
how did we see not only the plastic, but it's coming from land, most of it coming from the rivers of the coastal cities, but how much it's accumulating in the in the Mediterranean in specific areas. So I'll just finalize with the next slide, um, my, my presentation, um, just saying that for me, the one of the key things that a stakeholders could do at this moment and um, is one of the things that we did in another project that is a community of practice, meaning that um, many of us are working in the same thing and exchanging knowledge and exchanging information, best practices, and actually not only best practices, but lessons learned could support the work of others. And this is essential. Uh, actually, with the Beyond Plastic Med Association, we created this community of plastic right now, of practice right now is closed. But I think it's a huge and a great example of how different organizations that work very locally can share the results and scale up the results. So I'll stop here. Just uh, thank you very much. I just wonder how do you think that we can transition to a plastic free world. Uh, for me, it's very interesting to keep getting the information from many different stakeholders, because uh, as I said, we all do have ideas and all together we, we will reach um, a solution. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Mercedes, and thank you, Now It was a very inspiring presentation for me. Uh, I also tried uh, to link uh, the plastic pollution crisis in the chat so people can go and have a read. Uh, I sure will after the webinar because it sounded really interesting and I'm always really inspired how people can get creative and find uh, what is considered waste, you know, find solution to mm, give value to this, you know, by using their hands and brains and so on. It's really nice. Um, for me, there were two um, key messages that were really resonating uh, uh, with me. So first, uh, what I now mentioned uh, about Posidonia, you know, how we really need to take into account that environmental action has to be coupled with the perception that people have uh, of these solutions and really people need to be made aware uh, of the process. Uh, some of you mentioned co-designing of some processes. I think it was one of the best practices from Ingrid's uh, presentation, you know, co-development and involvement and engagement of, uh, of other stakeholders can really add this um, awareness and educational value that brings success in the end, because uh, the beach in the end was uh, healthier, but people also need to know that it's healthier, right? Otherwise, it seems to them at first glance that it's dirtier, but in fact, these Posidonia banquets are so helpful uh, for coastal erosion and so on. And the second point, how we transition from uh, the aspect of making others responsible by informing them and uh, you know awareness raising to what Mercedes was mentioning, also policy information and decision transferring this educational and awareness value to decision making so that we transition to action and this is really a key point for the for making responsible behavior something more concrete in a way that takes shape so thank you very much for uh, for this insight from the IUCN network. It was really wonderful to hear from you. Um, now I would like to uh, introduce the last speaker for the day. Uh, we have uh, David Golin from uh, Pika Peer. Um, Pika Peer is one treasure partner of Blue Flag as well. Uh, and uh, they have a platform designed to bring a new standard of Boulder Marina communication. So we're exploring a different uh, sector, still in the tourism area, uh, but this time more close to the, to the boating, the marinas, the ports. Uh, and via this platform, uh, marinas and uh, customers at the berths can save valuable time and resources. And we're gonna hear about this more from David. So thank you for being here today and you have the floor. Thank you for having me. Um, I cannot share my screen. It's disabled for some reason. Okay, there we go. Can you try again now? Yeah, yeah, now it's working fine. Thank okay. you very much. So you can all see my screen. Thank you very much. So uh, I'm delighted to be here today. Um, uh, thank you for having me. My name is David Golan uh, and uh, I, I work with Pick Up Here. I've been working with Pick Up Here for two and a half years. Uh, Pick Up Here is, as, as you mentioned, a platform that 
focuses on connecting marinas and uh, boaters together in a sustainable manner. Uh, prior to my role in Pick Up Pier, I've been working for uh, the international uh, container logistics company called Maersk. They're the world's largest uh, supply chain uh, provider. So I come with a background related to the ocean. I've spent a lot of my career uh, focusing on businesses related to the ocean. Speaking of the ocean, I mean, we, we've talked a lot about this uh, today in, in, the various, uh, in the various presentations. 71% of the world is covered by the ocean and 40% and, and of the world's population actually live by the ocean. We live off of it, we enjoy it, we benefit from it, and it's an important asset to the world. And, and we actually look at the recreational part of it, the tourism part of, of the ocean as part of the pick up here. So from our perspective, when we're looking at the recreational maritime industry, uh, we're looking at globally around 30,000 marinas. There is an exact clear definition of what is a marina. The, the definition varies from country to country, but there's roughly about 30,000 uh, marinas. There are more than 30 million boats on the ocean. These go from anywhere from dinghies, uh, jet skis, all the way up to uh, yachts and super yachts. And more than 200 million people can be considered boaters that are actually participating and uh, enjoying part of, of the industry and part of the ocean. Uh, the growth indicators of the industry are extremely high. There is an immense uh, economic contribution to countries. So many regard it as niche and neg negligible, but this is not really the case. The, the oceans and the marinas specifically provide a lot of tourist attractions, um, a lot of uh, commercial and economic activities. The demand for, for sailing yachts has been growing quite substantially, more than 5% a, a year over the past uh, decade. And the marina growth itself, the actual uh, building of marinas is quite stagnant. There aren't many countries around the world that are allowing building new marinas. So the actual growth and supply of birthing spaces is relatively limited. We're also seeing a massive shift in demographics. So we're seeing younger boaters entering the industry. Um, we're seeing more people, uh, specifically since COVID, working from home or that are enjoying more time in, in nature. And this is, of course, bringing in new new incumbents into the industry. In fact, a, a recent statistic shows that more there are more buyers today for the first time in history that are under the age of 40 that are buying boats than they are older than the age of 40. So it's, it's a big change in, 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 in the de demographics. So, you know, when talking about the industry, it's, it's generally a very traditional industry. And, and before we go into specifics of, of the industry, I'll just share a little bit brief about uh, of how Pick a Peer came to be. Pick a Peer is a commercial startup. We, we focus on profit. We want to grow and, and do what we can to connect and uh, um, connect and um, uh, bring uh, access to uh, boaters and marinas around the world. So uh, one of our co-founders, uh, Idan, he worked in, in his previous uh, role as part of the Tel Aviv municipality. He was a personal assistant to the company that organizes and manages the coastline of Tel Aviv. And their job was to try and make the coastline of Tel Aviv the most, one of the best world-class coastlines around, around the world. And to do this, he traveled to many different marinas around the world. And he you know, found that marinas are very, on the one hand, very sophisticated, it's a very sophisticated industry, but uses very, very traditional tools. There's a lot of magnetic boards, fax machine, files, lots of paper. And, you know, he looked at this and said, this, this cannot be that, you know, in the year 20, it was 2017 at the time, that this is still how marinas work. And basically, he decided, uh, together with his brother, to create a company, um, which is Pick a Pier. And today, the focus of Pick a Pier is to really try to help marinas, boaters, connect the industry together and to bring that infrastructure um, that is needed for, 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 for connecting and providing a, a better experience. So. Basically, you know, we talked about there's lots of new boats, a lot of new boaters, new traffic's coming into the industry. We see massive growth. COVID has been a massive catalyst for this. Um, a lot of uh, new boats are being bought by first-time boat buyers. There is approximately a ratio of 15 boats for every actual berth in the world. So there's a lot of, of course, dry dockings and stuff like that. And um, a lot of countries, I think 61% of the countries that participate in the International Council of Marine Industries um, declare that there is a, a supply stress in their countries. And 48% of the members actually want to actually build and construct new marinas. Of course, it's a lot more difficult to do. It's easier said than done. Um, it's very difficult to go and build new marinas. So we're talking about lots of boats, lots of growth, lots of traffic. 
but there's no new coastlines. And of course, it's very uh, difficult to, to build new marinas. So, you know, having a finite coastline, marinas are full capacity and they can't account to accommodate the, the, the growing demand. And this basically leads to us bringing a technological solution to try and optimize and digitize the industry to capitalize on the assets and the resources. So how is this done? So we see ourselves as a, as a company that facilitates digital uh, trans transformation. And digital transformation is not just taking a notebook or a magnetic board and transferring it to computer software. It's about utilizing the digital, school, the digital tools that we have to create much bigger value. It's about taking advantage of all these characteristics to change the way our marinas interact with boaters. So at its basic form, digital transformation is about collecting data. And by taking this data, utilizing and provide, you know, utilizing with numerous applications such as um, building comprehensive end-to-end -end services, using machine learning and artificial intelligence to allow us to better predict the boater activities and, and react accordingly. The infrastructure itself is nothing new. We've seen technologies of infrastructure in many different industries, in tourism industry, in, in, in flights, we've seen in different uh, technologies. So it's not about groundbreaking technology. It's about connecting and working together with the various in, uh, industry and the industry increments to try and make it all interconnected. Once we start collecting all this data, it will be a lot easier to, to analyze it. And of course, the idea behind what we're trying to do is have it open source that anybody will be interested in to could to contribute, contribute to it and also enjoy the fruits that, that come out of it. Looking ahead at, at sort of the future, what is the future in, in, in store for us? And we look at, you know, I mentioned we have the new generation of boaters. So we have new, uh, new boaters, they're becoming younger, they've never seen a fax in their life, they have different expectations. They're used to working with their mobile phones or a single screen. They want one stop, uh, one -stop shop services. They have a higher uh, standards of living, which is increasing, and new populations and new geographies are becoming more interested. We're also seeing supply challenges, which I've mentioned before, no new supplies. I can give an example. For example, in Israel, we have a 273 kilometers of coastline. We only have six marinas. There's enough demand to fill at least another 10 marinas. Best case scenario, what we've seen is one marina has been approved for, for construction in the next decade. So within 20 years, we've seen one marina being constructed and the rest of the marinas are being blocked mainly due to environmentalists. And, and of course there's public pushback because it's a short coastline and it needs to serve everyone's needs, not just uh, the boating industry. We're also seeing new business models. So the sharing economy, end-to-end -end services. Uh, I like the, uh, the, in one of the previous presentations, they're talking about the bicycles in Barcelona, I think it was. So there's also these uh, module, uh, models coming into um, the, the recreational boating industry, sharing of boats, et cetera. We've seen um, new technological de developments, you know, different APIs and interoperabilities to connect and digitize the world together. And of course, the increased environmental awareness and climate change. I think what we're all here today discussing is becoming more and more common uh, for the common business and common tourist uh, participant. So we talk about better utilizing existing marinas um, by using technology and optimizing. Using technology, we can basically replace the need to build and construct by new marinas. By connecting boaters, marinas, associations, organizations, government agencies together, we can transform the maritime industry. Um, and this can be done, sorry about that. This can be done um, you know, to, to unlock supply by having notifications when people are moving, it creates new products and services. And of course, it will also improve the customer experience. In other words, using more digital tools, you'll definitely become more sustainable and becoming more sustainable in this case will also result in, in higher profits. So we, could, we do about this mainly by using software. We don't believe necessarily in, in implementing hardware and, and using uh, um, physical uh, new devices to improve things. So we know that today, manufacturing of cars, for an example, even if you have electric cars, it still requires a lot of heavy metals. It has a massive environmental impact to mine the, 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 the heavy metals, et cetera, that's needed to produce. Same with IoT technologies. We're looking at in marinas, there are different providers that might use sensors, et cetera, in the marinas. And this too, it might improve in the long run the overall economic environment, but we see that it does create additional waste and increased demand for rare earth materials. 
So what we do and what we use in our platform is mainly using technologies, is using incentives, a um, combination of optimization and incentives without actual need for, for new hardware. By having everything digital and by having everything online, of course, we can also interact and engage differently with voters. And what we've done as part of our platform is that we've created a, a, a sailing club, a, you know, which is clearly focused on, on rewarding sustainable voters. We, of course, have the IP for the most famous sailor in the world, Popeye the Sailor Man, so he's uh, our mascot. And what we do is we focus on, once we onboard voters onto our platform, we provide an education for sustainable sailing. We encourage them by doing different things uh, in the platform, like uh, uh, planning the voyage in advance, notifying marinas when they're believing that a marina can resell that uh, additional space that can create for them points. Points is equal to benefits and discounts. We also have a, a sustainability pledge that we've uh, developed together with our colleagues here at the Blue Flag. And we also mark in our platform all the Blue Flag marinas, the environmentally friendly marinas. For the marinas themselves, they're also seeing an improved resident retention satisfaction. They're, of course, getting more out of the marina. There's more visibility uh, for visitors. And um, visitors themselves are, are more mindful and considerate to voters. So I talked a little bit about a sustainability pledge. Our sustainability uh, our pledge focuses on six key traits. So it's about protecting the waters, um, keeping clean and never dumping waste into the ocean, about safeguarding nature, only anchoring in places where it's permitted, being considerate, so of course, utilizing the facilities in the marina and not dumping sewage, et cetera, um, being eco-friendly, not using single-use plastics on board and, and making sure everything that the products that they use, et cetera, does not seep into the water. And of course, about being watchful and that's uh, uh, reporting any violations and sharing information among the community. Once a boat actually goes through the certification process in our platform, they're even were rewarded with a proper certificate that's uh, um, where they can be a, a Popeye sustainable, you know, they get a sustainable sailor pledge sign. Looking a little bit about marinas um, and, and smart marinas, um, the way we see the, the smart marina of the future, it's about having a easily accessible and, and easily accessible basically means being transparent, so being clear on the conditions, the supply, the services available, um, what are the procedures that are needed to get to the marina. It needs to be simple, um, easy of doing things in line with what customers expect these days. So, you know, it, online digital interactions with marinas, uh, seamlessness in operations that the procedures uh, bring visitors and, and visits into a very um, simple processes of getting uh, in, into the marina. And of course, providing a uniform experience. When we look at the efficient, uh, efficient side of the future marina, we of course want to reduce the operational burden. And this is having simplified, digitized, maybe automated procedures that's also connected with governments and additional uh, parties involved. So sharing information, not just about uh, having automation internally. It's increased personalization. It's knowing the voters, his needs, his habits, and, and with a higher accuracy maximizing the usage of the assets by using technology, by understanding demand better to utilize all, um, all available birds, all available water without actually having to go and construct new marinas and having the demand uh, visibility. On the interconnected side of things, it's about having uh, connections, being able to offer services outside of your sphere, outside of your marina, so inter, uh, interoperable with, with platforms, um, with governments, et cetera. And most importantly, the integration with surrounding communities. We talked about marinas being a uh, financial anchor for normally the city that surrounds them. So it's enabling the community to be part of this and offering additional services and, and products outside of the marina within the city limits. And of course, Universal is um, being part of a global ecosystem, being part of a bigger system, sharing information with other marinas, et cetera, best practices, sustainable methods, and all of this to help uh, in, for the industry as a, a whole wide industry to enjoy the benefits. So what can they do big, break, big data bring to our, our industry? It's about bringing market visibility. So understanding voters' behaviors, uh, popular routes, uh, clear and current status of where things are. It's about predicting demand, knowing where the trends are, um, using the wide statistical data to understand demand, the future market behaviors, short-term and long-term. 
and of course, comprehensive insights and having a wide picture about the voter, understanding the visibility of where the voters be and where they're going to, and help provide completely new services and revenue streams. So we basically can use a technology to connect a very fragmented uh, supply of births around the world and make the most out of it. And this is what Pick a Peer does at our heart is, is we really try to uh, bring both to demand with underutilized marina supply in a dynamic uh, marketplace. The change is under the way. Uh, we are very proud to be working with Blue Flag, uh, we're associated with Blue Flag, Blue Flag's partners. And of course, we work with uh, Trans Europe with various governments and working in various environments. And, and at, the, at the core of it is to try and bring the latest innovation solutions to protect the environment, to see how we can develop environmentally responsible, efficient, attractive, um, user-friendly marinas that also a lively place where people want to be. So, um, you know, the maritime industry, it's, it's welcoming the new generations of boaters. If some of you are not a, a boater, we encourage you to become one. It's now easier than ever. If you're already a boater, there are better ways to sail. You can come join our community. We focus on proving communication, building awareness, uh, promoting and incentivizing sustainable behavior. If you're an industry decision maker, we'd love to connect and integrate with you and, and work together with you on how we can bring more knowledge to the boaters. And, uh, and that's basically it. So that's what I have all for today. If there's any questions? Thank you, David, for the inspiring pre the presentation, because I think it adds another piece of the puzzle in this very complex uh, uh, picture of uh, responsibility and, of course, sustainability when it comes to tourism. Uh, sustainability looks at solutions in the present, you know, to also safeguard uh, uh, the needs of future generations. And of course, when we talk about future, we also need to take into account that innovation is there. And really the presentation that David shared uh, shows that technology can be part of the solution. And uh, in this case, the help us achieve, for example, the coupling, because by increasing the efficiency, optimizing, rationalizing the use of the resources we have, we might uh, have less need to consume more, to build more in this case, and really make the most of what we have already. Um, and I would like to uh, take stock a little bit uh, before we move on to maybe questions if the chat has many. And again, I invite uh, people in the chat and uh, uh, who are present today to share their questions for the speakers if they have some. But before we move to that phase, I would like to, again, take stock a little bit because a lot has been said, and uh, I feel we can benefit from it. I think we started, you know, with uh, this presentation by Eakley, by Ingrid, mentioning how important it is to, uh, well, by nature, by, by what they do, you know, at Eakley, connect uh, and uh, favor this exchange of best practices, of solutions between different uh, stakeholders. In this case, you know, it can be cities, it can be regional authorities and so on, on how they deal with some environmental issues and how it is important to enable others to uh, behave responsibly by educating, by engaging, by co-designing. And this we saw from some of the best practices that, we, that we were brought to the table from the ECLI network. Then we had uh, a presentation by Arnau and Mercedes from IUCN. They have talked about, for example, Arnau in the case of Posidonia was really stressing the importance of tackling both the environmental and societal issues at the same time. Um, and talking about Posidonia, I really want to open a little um, bracket there because we recently had a webinar, right? And uh, now the Sustainable Posidonia Management this month uh, that we uh, that was really interesting. I was there, uh, we, we helped a little bit with a, a promotion of the webinar and uh, I invite everyone to read a little bit about it because it was really an interesting insight on uh, what uh, sites, the destinations on the coast can do uh, to uh, use and, and manage this resource uh, and this important, uh, uh, you know, uh, component of coastal ecosystems in a sustainable way. So uh, there was a lot of uh, take home messages there regarding how uh, it is important to inform stakeholders about uh, also environmental initiatives when 
uh, decisions are taken. And then Mercedes was also talking about a big issue that is nowadays so important uh, when we take decisions, uh, for example, the plastic component, right, of pollution, because after all, this uh, is part of a webinar series that is indeed about pollution reduction. And I think what is so interesting about the plastic thing, Mercedes, what you were saying that it starts in the land, right? So it is a long chain. And I remember this video you were sharing where the currents were um, kind of bringing this pollution around in uh, Malepnostum, which is then Malplasticum, right, in this report. And um, it, it shows how everyone has to do their little bit uh, because if we can stop these uh, streams of pollution at the land, we can really simplify a little bit the, the problem that we have to face afterwards. But then again, another point that Mercedes was raising is how this building of education and awareness has to also uh, contribute to decision making at some point, right, and inform policies and other stakeholders in order to pass on the next step, which is action. And this action uh, is a collection of decisions naturally from authorities, from companies, from consumers as well. Uh, but we have uh, one strong ally in this that is not the entire solution, but it, it can be a support, uh, a supporting component that is technology, right? And innovation. Uh, but this does not replace, as I was reading in uh, some of the comments in the chat, uh, this does not replace the responsibility that users and stakeholders have. Uh, we have sensitive natural areas, we have resources, natural resources, we have the coastal areas, for example, and these are um, environments that belong to humanity, right? And uh, we have a responsibility, and here is the responsible tourist kicking in, right? We have a responsibility to take care of these and to behave in a way that does not harm these resources and environments. So we really need to uh, treasure them and to acknowledge that our actions have impact. And uh, I see that uh, Ioannis was raising this point regarding one Natura 2000, sorry, <laughs> Natura 2000 site. Uh, so as tourists and end consumers and local communities and stakeholders, we really have um, an opportunity there to, to, to do the right decision, to make the right decision and uh, to treasure these resources. Now, I don't think, uh, let's see, I see another uh, uh, question here in the chat. Uh, so uh, for IUCN, uh, is the webinar about Posidonia available uh, to be watched if someone missed it? Yes, uh, we are uh, collecting all the outcomes of the work of the workshop and should be in our website within a week or two. Uh, the recording and some additional materials and resources that were that were shared. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Lovely. Uh, so uh, uh, we'll stay tuned with the IUCN website because that way you can uh, uh, catch up with the past webinars. And by the way, you can also catch up with the webinars of the Little Less Plus and Acting Against Pollution series uh, that the Foundation for Environmental Education organized in the past uh, months uh, that all have to do with the sustainable tourism uh, thread, so to speak and uh, how this uh, impacts and is impacted by uh, pollution streams uh, and, and what we can do to uh, be part of the solution in a way. Um, so I don't see any other question from the chat. I know that uh, a couple of speakers also need to leave uh, uh, quite soon, but before we say goodbye, I would like to share a, a little uh, invitation with everyone for the next uh, uh, webinar from the uh, foundation. Uh, can you tell me if you can see it? Can you see my screen? Yeah. Yes, so we can. The next uh, episode of the series will be Circular Economy and Tourism. And this is organized by our sister program, Green Key, also uh, regarding sustainable tourism, in particular in the hospitality industry. Uh, if you scan the QR code, uh, you can access the registration link. So make sure not to miss it because it's gonna be very interesting. I'm also gonna be there uh, because I'm very curious about this webinar. 
Um, after all, circular economy was mentioned in many of the presentations from today. It is indeed one of the approaches that are part of the solution. And as Mercedes was pointing out, a way to really uh, use what can be considered by some a waste stream, so something harmful, something undesired, uh, a new resource that we can really mine uh, in a way to uh, avoid extracting more uh, or like demanding more of the environment and putting more pressure, while indeed reducing the pressure that the waste streams are generating. So reducing the impact of pollution and so on. This is gonna be on the 31st of August uh, and we would really love to have you there again. Uh, I would like to thank once again the speakers of today. It was a pleasure working with you and a pleasure having you today. I hope uh, also the people who were here, uh, the audience uh, found it interesting. I sure, I sure did. And I hope the people who will uh, watch the recording will also take home some messages from uh, the presentations of today. They were really interesting. Uh, so thank you everyone for participating and I wish you a lovely, lovely rest of the afternoon, evening, morning, day, wherever you're based uh, and hope to see you soon in the next episodes of the webinar. So see you all. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.